Good morning. Over the last few weeks, we have been working through a series entitled Preparing for a Different World. We have been thinking about how we process and manage all the disruptions that we have experienced during this pandemic, and also about how to emerge on the other side of it. To help us with this challenge, we have been looking at the book of Deuteronomy, a book which describes Moses getting the people of Israel ready for the challenges of entering the land that God has promised to them. As we have seen over the last few weeks, Moses underlined for them the key things they needed to remember, including their previous encounters with God, the need to love God wholeheartedly, and the need to avoid getting ensnared by idols. Today, I want to think with you about the dangers of prosperity. By way of introduction this morning, it is interesting, I think, to think together about what has happened in the past when times of austerity and challenge have come along. Back at the start of the 20th century, the Great War of 1914 to 18, an international tragedy, was closely followed by the Spanish flu pandemic. And that, as you probably are aware, gave way to what became known as the Roaring Twenties, a time of excessive and extravagant consumption and personal spending, for some at least, that eventually imploded dramatically with the Wall Street crash of 1929. Some of the underlying reasons for the Roaring Twenties were probably relief at being alive and a heightened awareness of the shortness of life. Nations saw rapid industrial and economic growth, accelerated consumer demand, and they introduced significant new trends in lifestyle and culture. Various pundits have speculated that the end of COVID, if of course there is an end with all these variants morphing away, may signal just such an upsurge as people are desperate to spend some of their unexpected savings on travel, houses and consumables. All of which makes the passage today an interesting one to consider. When we read through Deuteronomy, it is pretty clear that Moses is well aware of the true condition of the hearts of his people. True, they are God's chosen people, but he catalogues their sins, failures, and rebellion against God with little desire to spare their blushes. He knows that it will be hard for them to follow God's laws and commands, but he reminds them that God's requirements for their lives are not impossible. They will not need Jeff Bezos' spaceship to get up there to find out what God wants from them. They will not need some fancy speedboat to cross the seas to get hold of God's commands. He assures them that God's word has come to them and is available to them. They have spoken it out and it has found its way into their hearts. But the critical question is not whether they can discover God's will for their lives, but whether they can obey it. Moses then presents the people with a choice. And it's the kind of choice that seems at first to be a no-brainer. Option number one is to take a path that leads to life and prosperity. Option number two is to take a path that leads to death and destruction. Mm, let's just think about that for a moment, Moses. That first path sounds pretty interesting, but that second path probably has good things going for it too. What? There's nothing inviting about death and destruction. 
But why then would the history of Israel prove that that second path would be the one they consistently chose? That's because the path of life and prosperity that Moses is describing involves loving God, walking in his ways, and keeping his commands. Under the covenant that God had made with Israel, he promised to be their God and to bless them and to prosper them as they walked with him. Prosperity, at least in the Old Testament, was to be a litmus test for Israel's faithfulness to God. But Moses, never one to be bashful in addressing his fellow Israelites, warns them again that if their hearts turn away and they refuse to be obedient to God's commands, and if they bow down to other gods and worship them, then they will experience option two, death and destruction, and ultimately eviction from the land they have been promised. If this was the choice that confronted the people of Israel as they stood on the brink of the new future that awaited them, what are the choices that we face as we consider the new world post-COVID? And why, Andy, I can hear some of you asking, have you entitled this sermon, The Dangers of Prosperity, when the passage we read seems to indicate that prosperity is a sign of God's blessing? Let me wrestle out the answer to the second question first. I mentioned just now that in the Old Testament, prosperity was directly linked to God's blessing of the Israelites, the litmus test of their faithfulness to the covenant. But we, most of us, Gentiles, non-Jews, do not stand in that Old Testament covenantal relationship with God. Jesus has come and died on the cross and opened a new covenant of relationship with God for all of us who believe in him. As a result of our faith in his self-sacrifice, we are forgiven and welcomed into his family and drawn into his mission, which is to bless the world supremely by drawing everyone into reconciled relationship with him. The benefits that we get from this new covenant are essentially relational, not material. We have access to the Father and the Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts. The good news that Jesus brings to us is not a guarantee of wealth or prosperity in this life. Remember how Jesus told his followers that in this world, you will have trouble. In fact, wealth in the New Testament is often seen as a significant obstacle to being able to enter God's kingdom at all. In Matthew 19, 23, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is not that wealth in and of itself is bad. It is just that it has the capacity to become the center of safety and security for us, effectively blinding us to the reality of God's care and love for us. It's why the Apostle Paul can joyfully announce in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. Hopefully, you can now see more clearly the danger of prosperity as it affects all of us as we emerge from the pandemic. God has blessed all of us with resources simply by virtue 
of living in a wealthy country like Canada. The temptation to spend self-indulgently is there for all of us. And we'll be encouraged by advertisers and businesses as we begin to come out of the pandemic. But our reference point is not everyone else. As followers of Jesus, our primary allegiance is to him. He is the Lord. If he has entrusted us with resources, he is the one who has the first word and the last word over our wallets. The biggest danger in prosperity is that we can quite quickly forget that it is God who has put us into such a position. Over the last 2,000 years, prosperity itself has dulled the cutting edge of mission for the church much more effectively than persecution. Moses concludes our passage today with an exhortation. He urges the people to choose life so that they and their children may live and that they may love the Lord their God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. Rather than leaping headlong into a wild, roaring 20s-style spending spree, what will choosing life look like for us going forward? Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 are surely relevant here. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may be able to take hold of the life That is truly life. I don't know about you, but wherever I seem to look, there are opportunities to make good things happen. A few weeks ago, we interviewed Daniel Berge from Himalayan Life. Shortly after that interview, there was a catastrophic event in the monsoon, where the recently built school that was serving 300 children in the remote Yangri Valley was swept away in a horrifying flash flood. By the grace of God, there was no loss of life. Plans are currently being made to rebuild. That's the kind of project that has me stirred up. And helping fund that sounds like a great way to choose life, bless others, particularly those who have very little, and lay up treasure in the coming age. Head over to the Himalayan Life website to find out more. You personally may know of other great opportunities. Let's all be praying for open eyes for good opportunities, and let's embrace generosity together. Let's choose life together as we come out of this pandemic.